Okay. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Chris Esposito and I am a research scientist at the Water Institute of the Gulf. I, um, I, I am really happy to welcome everybody to this meeting. Uh, this is the Bay Denise Living Lab uh, public meeting and I uh, really appreciate how many people are here and in particular I, I'm really excited to see uh, so many people who haven't been involved in this project in the past or whose names I don't even really know. So I, I think uh, part of the part of the part of the point here is for people to be able to meet each other and interact with each other and 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 sort of build a, a basis for collaboration. So I'm really happy that there are so many people who have showed up who uh, who who I'm I don't even know some of the names. So it's really two thumbs up on that. I'm really really thrilled. Thank you. Um, so. I'm going to kick things off here, but before I begin, there are a couple of people that I want to thank. Um, the first is the National Academies of Science um, Gulf Research Program. This um, uh, the, the this meeting is a part of a broader project funded by um, NASGRP um, under one of their. Sorry, let me make sure my slides can advance. There we go. Um, it, the the project was funded under a uh, research practice grant. The title of the project was Transport Thresholds for Fine Sediment and Vegetation. It was a collaboration between the Water Institute, MIT, and uh, Tulane University. And the, the idea of these grants, the idea of these research practice grants, was really to get people who consider themselves to be researchers in the same room and in the same conversation with people who consider themselves mostly to be uh, restoration practitioners. So in this case, of course, as the title suggests, we're trying to do that um, in, the, in the field of, of sediment transport in marshes, and deltaic marshes. And the, the, the project really took on two two tracks, right? Two tracks that had to be connected to one another periodically. Um, the first is a, is, a, is a research track where we're looking at a field study of sediment transport and vegetation and uh, a, a lab study and a companion numerical modeling study, um, all looking at, at uh, sediment transport through vegetative environments. And then there was this um, practitioner panel engagement. And that actually brings me to the second group of people that I want to thank here. And really the reason for the meeting today is to talk about the work that this uh, practitioner panel has been doing and some of the interactions that we've been having. So this is a group that's been attached to the, um, to the project here for about three years. And we've met approximately every six months or so. Obviously the last year has been a little bit weird, but the, these have mostly been meetings where, uh, you know, we have, two goals of this uh, of panel, right? And they're, they're both written on the side. The one is for this panel to serve as something of a conduit through which research outcomes in the project um, will actually arrive on the desk of someone who's gonna make a decision based off of them. And the second, and I think this is most relevant to the meeting today, the second is to really serve as a hub of collaboration around the questions that we were addressing in the um, in the project. And you can see by all of the logos there, unfortunately, I never got everyone on the panel all together at one time in a situation where I could take a photo that it wasn't on Zoom. But you can see by all the logos that it's a really diverse group of organizations and interests um, that, that came together for some of these conversations. So these were a lot of fun, really vibrant discussions. And, and I think you'll see some of that um, outcome today. Um, there are universities represented here, nonprofit research institutes like the Water Institute, um, nonprofit advocacy organizations, um, nonprofit restoration organizations. There are state coastal management organizations, um, uh, federal agencies, several different federal agencies, um, a, a community college. It was just a really interesting group of organizations to bring to the table for these conversations. So I, I really appreciate every single person who's uh, been able to to show up. Um, hopefully, I've I've remembered every logo and every organization that's that's shown up. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get every picture, but it was really a very um, delightful way to spend a good bit of time. So um, with that, thank you to NAS and thank you to the practitioner panel. Uh, I'm going to give everybody here an overview of uh, sort of what to expect over the next two hours. Um, we have a pretty packed schedule today. The first thing, obviously, is that introduction that I'm giving right now. But after that, the, the meeting is going to be uh, arranged into three blocks, fairly loosely arranged, but we are going to try to keep to this schedule. 
Um, the, the yellow block at the top is going to be essentially a, a description of the overall project um, that we've been working on, partially from a research perspective. So there's two main presentations. It's myself um, and then Heidi Neff from MIT. And I'm going to give a presentation on some of the, the research outcomes from this project from the perspective of the um, field study. And Heidi is gonna talk a little bit about the lab work. But I'm also gonna use that to introduce what I'm hoping will become this Bay Denise Living Lab, which is really the, the, the topic of today's conversation. And I, you know, we'll talk about that quite a bit more um, a little bit later, but basically I would like to set up this area, this space in Bay Denise, as a spot where really active collaboration between researchers and restoration practitioners and any number of other people can take place. And I think that we've had enough conversation that we're sort of well on the way to do that. So part of the point of this meeting is really to bring other people on board to let, let that be known throughout the community more generally and, um, and really build a, you know, build a, build a collaborative environment there. Um, so after that first block, the second one, which is in, I guess, a light sort of green color, there are going to be two presentations, one uh, from Ron Bastani from NRCS. He's going to be talking about a vegetation planting that will be taking place at, at Bay Denise. Um, and that planting is really important to this project because it's, it's really guided a lot of our idea about how research and practice interact with one another. And then the second, um, Cassidy Lejeune from Ducts Unlimited is going to be talking about some terracing projects that they've done and some vegetation plantings that they're just about to do, uh, I think, next month at, uh, at, at Bay Denise. Um, Cassidy, unfortunately, isn't able to be here, but he was kind enough to record his, uh, his presentation yesterday with a brief little Q&A. And, um, and uh, I believe his colleague, Mike Carlos, is here as well to answer questions if any arise. Um, and then the third part in this light blue color is going to be a, a series of presentations from people who were on the most recent um, meeting of this practitioner advisory plan on panel. So uh, first is going to be uh, Jacqueline Fletcher. Um, uh, uh, pardon, pardon me, Jacqueline uh, Richard from Fletcher Community College um, talking about engaging community college students and then sediment delivery and retention. And I should also mention that a lot of the meeting um, that we recently have was essentially designing small scale experiments that could take place at, at Bay Denise. So that was our way of, of designing an interaction between the restoration community and the, and the research community that would hopefully be something we could implement as a, as a large scale landscape scale um, scientific experiment. So um, Jacqueline Richard, Emily Farrer and uh, Madeline Foster Martinez are all gonna give brief presentations on that. And then after that's finished, we'll have about a 30 minute Q and A um, at the end where members of the audience um, can, can ask questions, which will be sort of harvesting throughout the um, throughout the throughout the uh, next two hours. So a little bit about uh, the logistics of 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 how this um, meeting is going to work. Um, everybody has two windows um, in your um, I don't think I have a good way of sharing this to show but if you look at the bottom of the zoom controls you'll see a Q&A window and also a chat window. If you have questions of any of the presenters and the panelists, you can ask them in the Q&A window. Um, we'll add, answer which ones we can during the presentation, but we'll also harvest some of those to actually pose to the panel and pose to the presenters at the, um, at the, during the, the last part of the meeting, during that half hour at the end. The second window is a chat window. Um, and I would encourage people to talk to each other in the chat. I, I think that everybody has permission to talk to everybody else. And um, you know, part of the point of this kind of activity really is to 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 make, to make friends and meet people. So unfortunately, we can't shake hands and be in the same room. We're all in our own living rooms or wherever. But but that that chat function is actually kind of nice. And I guess one of the benefits of 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 these Zoom meetings is that you can uh, interact a little bit um, and still pay attention as well. Um, I'm putting my email up there uh, just so everyone has it. Um, uh, Please use it. Reach out if you if you um, see anything interesting and want to get back in touch. Um, I also want to mention that this meeting is being recorded um, and it'll be saved to the Water Institute's YouTube channel. And I'm very glad I added this reminder because I was intending to drop the agenda into the meeting chat. Um, and then the reminder is to remind me if I haven't. I clearly haven't done that. 
Um, but I'm wondering if somebody in the Water Institute can put that PDF into the meeting chat so that everybody has a copy of the agenda. So there's something a little bit uh, tangible to hold on to. So um, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm gonna start this off by talking a little bit about some of the field data collection and the, and the field research project that we did as a part of this project. And that's a way of pivoting to explaining what the Beta Nice Living Lab is and, and is going to be and the kinds of activities that I'm hoping it will host. So this is a, 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 an abbreviated version of a presentation I usually give under this title, Rapidly Changing Transport Conditions in a Deltaic Mars. Um, there are four co-authors here um, uh, 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 Diana Di Leonardo, Heidi Nepf, uh, Melissa Boschian, and uh, then in particular, um, Marcel Beltran Burgos, who I wanna thank because a lot of this made up her, um, her master's thesis, which was just defended last month. So a lot of the slides that I will be showing come from either Marcel or some of the other uh, members here. So the work we were doing, the, 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 the project that we put together was was really essentially to to, um, uh, to address two two separate questions, right? The first is at the top there, it's by what mechanisms does vegetation interact with flow to affect fine grain sediment storage in coastal and deltaic marshes? And the second, which I think follows from that very quickly, is how can the operational design for diversions and for managed marshes be adjusted in order to maximize sediment retention. And the way we look at this is really through, I guess, three legs of a stool you might consider. It. The first is the vegetation that's growing on the marsh. And so we were going out and taking measurements of the physical characteristics of the wetland vegetation as it grew in throughout the course of the year. So this um, might be stem density or stem diameter, um, the species, of course, the, the, the shape of the leaves, and just the physical characteristics of the vegetation. So this is really important because the vegetation on the marsh is clearly going to have a major impact on the flow conditions in the marsh. Right. So what you see down there is a dye injection study that we um, we did, and that dye is intended to um, uh, uh, to to mark the flow coming from the channel into the um, into the into the into the wetland. So so far we're looking at vegetation, we're looking at flow conditions, and then we're going to have measurements of sediment conditions in the um, in the channel. So the idea here is to see how the vegetation is controlling the flow on the marsh and the connections between the, the channel and the marsh and how that will eventually be recorded in the amount of sediment that's delivered to the marsh, deposited in the marsh and retained in the marsh. So we're really looking at the interaction of veg vegetation, flow and sedimentation and how the three of those work together to control the, um, the deposition of sediment, which just getting back to the first piece is clearly an important consideration for managed marshes and diversions that seek to maximize the, the delivery of, 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 of uh, sediment. So we, we were working, this is an overhead image of the study site we were working in. Um, this is uh, the deltaic marsh. We're actually in the Mississippi River Birdsfoot Delta in Cubits Gap. Um, and there's two sub environments that I have noted. One is the patch, which is an environment that has relatively permanent, um, permanent vegetation uh, established on it. And the other is the mudflat, which begins each year, at least at the moment, um, as, a, uh, as, a, as a barren of vegetation. Right? It's a fairly barren area, and then the vegetation grows in throughout the year. Um, each white dot that you see here is a, um, uh, is, a, is a location where we were taking sediment samples uh, from the water, also um, sediment accretion samples from the bed, and measurements of uh, vegetation as well. And the, uh, the two gauges you see here, this blue one is, is a gauge where we were collecting um, suspended sediment measurements in the marsh. And the, the, uh, the companion one, we had suspended sediment measurements both as a gauge and an automated water sampler in the, uh, in the channel. So I, 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 I talked about this as sort of three, um, you know, three legs of a stool. And the, the first is the vegetation. So we're really looking carefully at how the vegetation is changing throughout the year. Um, what you're looking at right now is a picture, two pictures actually, of the mud flat during April of 2019. That's early in the dry season, and you can see that it's fairly barren. 
So in April, the mud flat was essentially unvegetated, uh, but for a little bit of patchy SAV here and there. But this is a completely different picture than what you would see just a couple of months later in June. And so in June, you have this condition where the submerged aquatic vegetation, that's this, uh, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the, the sort of darker colored um, vegetation has grown in very, very rapidly and very, very densely. So we went from a condition of about 0% vegetation coverage in, um, in the early part of the year, in early spring, to late spring, early summer, we have uh, just about 70% vegetation coverage in here. And then interestingly, if we go forward another month, what happened was a lot of that SAV died back and the emergent vegetation and some of these patches of densely floating vegetation are left, but that really dense matrix of submerged aquatics is no longer there. So we went from a condition, you know, in just a couple of months from no vegetation to very densely vegetated and then back to this patchier configuration here. And of course, that has a really important influence on the flow patterns. So I'm going to show you a couple of uh, these dye injection images that we collected. This is the first one in April. You should see a green patch that's fluorescein dye that we deployed on the marsh. And you could see that it traveled very quickly along the, along the marsh. And we use that to, as one of the tools that we use to measure marsh velocity, uh, flow velocity through the marsh. Um, the second is this one in July. And I should mention that the frame rate is the same. So you really can compare the velocities here. In July, this patch, which is now rhodamine dye, it's the red patch, is going very, very slowly. Um, and so the, the, the velocities here have dropped down to around 4%. And then if I go to the last one, we get this interesting situation. There's the flow is going in a different direction now. But you can see the velocity is picked up a little bit, but it's not quite where it used to be. So now we're around eight centimeters a second. So this is a you know really good way of visualizing the influence that the vegetation has on the flow patterns in the marsh, and to some extent the exchange between the channel and the marsh. So that's two legs of our stool, and then the third. Got to do these on clicks. Let me go through. Oh, and I'm sorry, this is, this is um, you know, very much the same data. This is a velocity um, time series on the mudflat. And, and what you're looking at is as the vegetation is growing in throughout the course of the year, the velocity is dropping very quickly. And that's what we were able to visualize in the dye injection. So that's two legs of our stool, I would say. We've talked about the vegetation and the flow patterns. I want to talk a little bit about the suspended sediment. So I, I mentioned that we had measures, measurements of suspended sediment from the, um, from the channel. This is what you see in, in, uh, in the gray line. And then also from the, the mudflat actually in the marsh, which is what you see in these purple dots. And I want to point out two pulses of sediment. We actually you know, did a good bit of work to verify that these are mineral sediments in the river. Um, this one pulse that happens around April and another one that happens in June um, uh, that you can see it in these increases. And if you look at the, the correlation, I guess, the relationship between what's going on in the channel, in the gray line, and in the um, mudflat in the dots, you can see that in the early one, when there is really no vegetation in the system, they're very closely correlated. So an increase in suspended sediments in the channel is translated to an increase in suspended sediments in the, in the marsh as well. That does not seem to be the case later. So if you look at June, when the marsh is actually fairly well vegetated, the increase in suspended sediments in the channel simply does not make its way onto the marsh. And that's really important because that's a picture of the vegetation um, I, I, controlling the connection between the, between the marsh and the, um, and the uh, and the channel, between the channel and the marsh. So that's a really interesting uh, figure that came out of this and a really important one when you think of managing these types of situations for the, for the maximum sediment import, because you want to get the sediment to the marsh when it's most tuned to actually receive it, if, that, if at all possible. Um, we also collected measurements of sediment accretion, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll simply show this plot um, which shows the, the mass accretion of sediment 
at all of our tiles that we have throughout the mudflat and the patch environment. And the most important point here is that the, the, the really strong reduction that you see in sedimentation in the, in the later parts of the spring is because the vegetation is actually preventing sediment from getting onto the marsh platform. So the periods where the vegetation is densest correspond to the periods where the vegetation, I'm sorry, the periods where the vegetation is densest correspond to the periods when the sediment accretion is the lowest. So just kind of a, a, a rapid tour here, but we end up with the, the following conclusions, right? One is a rapid increase in vegetation corresponds with a rapid decrease in sedimentation. When the vegetation is most prominent, the channel and the marsh are decoupled from one another. So that was a really interesting point that came out of this. And then I want to tie it back to set up the, the, the rest of the meeting today to, to diversion operation strategies, because really the intent here is to look at how you might use this information to inform operational strategies in the, um, in the outfall areas of major diversions or managed marshes. And I think it's pretty clear that there's a period of time where the uh, marsh is very well attuned to receive sediment, retain sediment, there's a time when it's not. And that's something that's, I think, worth looking into and also worth experimenting with a little bit. And so with that, I'm gonna pivot a little bit to my introduction of what the, the Bay Denise Living Lab is or what I hope it's going to um, become and and the 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 reason I I showed all of that information a moment ago the sort of research side of the work was really to set the stage for the kinds of things that I think would 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 do very well in a in a collaborative environment like that so you know back to this 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 same figure right we, we're we're thinking again of of how vegetation flow and suspended sediment interact with one another to, to control sediment delivery to the marshes. And we spent a lot of time through this project, obviously thinking about that and, 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 and looking about that and, and talking about that with this panel. And one of the things that came out of the discussions with this panel was it would be really interesting to do some tests in environments that we had a little bit more control over. So through, through the discussions of this group, we actually were able to submit an application to a program that's called the LA39 Coastal, I believe it's a Coastal Revegetation Initiative. And that program will actually go, it's a quick refunded program which you or I or anyone can really apply to. And that program will go and, and plant vegetation in an environment that seems like it would benefit from, um, from from additional vegetation, coastal vegetation planting in that in that area. So Ron Bastani is going to talk about this program and about how we used it within these panel discussions a little more in just a couple of minutes. But this is a really good chance to, to do some active experimentation at a landscape scale, which is not something that's typically on the table for, for, um, for researchers to do. In, in these types of environments. So with that in mind, that sort of interaction, the idea that you could actually work with the restoration practitioners, plan restoration projects at a landscape scale as an experiment that would then feed into the restoration practice later on, really sets the stage for what I'm hoping that this Bay Denise Living Lab is going to become. And if you'll indulge me here, I apologize. I am, I am going to read this entire paragraph because I, I, I think it's important to get all of these points across. So, all right, I'll take a breath. So the Bay Denise Living Lab is conceived as a location and a set of activities that will foster organized coordination and the exchange of creativity between the coastal restoration practitioner and research communities. It builds around the idea that while members of the research community are skilled at controlled experimentation, they do not usually have the ability to alter landscapes and ecosystems at scale. And while restoration practitioners do have that ability, their work would be enhanced and would be improved over time with rigorous experimentation and in-depth monitoring efforts to facilitate comparisons between projects and improvements to techniques. So what we were trying to do, what we are trying to do, is establish a site that has the following three things in place and use this as a tool for collaboration and experimentation among a really wide range of people. So the three things in place are one, physical infrastructure, just a couple of constructed platforms that we could use to visit the site, uh, maybe mount some instruments, 
um, go out and take a tour, you know, whatever. There's a lot of benefit to having a place to stand in a, in, in a marsh like this. Um, another would be logistical support. So if, if, if the, the, the Water Institute is really committed to, to supporting work that would be done in this place, and that might be um, compiled environmental data, some historical information that might be, um, well, like it says here, a network of knowledgeable collaborators, like a, a community of people that are that are using this environment that can interact with one another to, to add um, some context and some real interest to, to proposals that might come out of that. Additionally, relationships with landowners and uh, government stakeholders to streamline permitting and just get people out in this environment that's not entirely easy to access all of the time. And then the third thing is really, I think, what this meeting is about, which is a community of collaboration around this environment, right? So the, the, the whole point of having a space like this, having a living lab like this, is to get people from a lot of different walks of life and a lot of different organizational structures to use it and to get out here and plan work and plan experiments and work with practitioners and researchers and educators to actually use this site together. And the, that togetherness is a really important part of this. So I, that's, that's sort of what I'm hoping a lot, of this, um, a lot of this meeting and a lot of this interaction in the future turns into. Um, so I'm gonna close with a couple of things that we at the Water Institute are doing to sort of get the ball rolling here. Um, and, and this is something that is uh, you know, starting as a snowball and I hope will um, we'll turn into something larger. Um, the, the first is we, we've devoted some funds to actually constructing these monitoring platforms. So we're gonna go out and, and place some of these platforms in the environment. And part of the um, conversation with the practitioner advisory panel over the last several weeks has been devising something of a modern monitoring strategy that would allow us to go and choose where to put these, these platforms appropriately. And you'll see a little bit of that strategy later on in the meeting today. Um, the, the, the second is just a compilation of background information. We've actually submitted a, a good number of proposals in this site or related ones that have, have just taken a lot of work to pull together. And uh, you know, for the ones that, that, that I am uh, in charge of, I'd be happy to share a lot of the background information that we have with other people who would be interested in working in this site. And so that's sort of an effort to really draw people into this as a collaborative environment. The third is staff. You might recognize this picture um, from earlier. This is a uh, Marcella Beltran Burgos. She is uh, was uh, the master student that was attached to this project for several years, um, and she is going to be helping get the uh, Bay Denise Living Lab really uh, stood up um, over the course of the next couple of months. Um, and you know, her history with this project makes her a really fantastic addition to that to that team. Um, the last is um, uh, partners, right? This is, this is again, part and parcel of the sort of collaborative environment. So the more people that are working in a place like this, the easier it is to access, the easier it is to develop fundable proposals, the easier it is to, uh, easier it is to refine your ideas. Um, stakeholder resources, there are a number of people that work in this environment um, that have agreed to provide either logistical support or um, equipment or things like that, that could be used for for the for, for projects in the area, um, and that you know, and that has a couple of different forms, but that's something that we've really been working towards in getting um, collaborative collaborative uh, efforts. And the fourth is sort of an overall monitoring strategy. And I mentioned already that some of the panel meetings um, were designed to create that, and and this is sort of one of the things that I think would really. Um, underlay a, a broader effort with a lot of people if there was a, a baseline monitoring strategy. So that's something we're really trying to get in place. Um, so the next steps here, I guess I, I, I'll just indicate here, the, the, the really important next pieces are to develop collaborations and, and, and fundable collaborations among people who want to work in this area, so we really are out here trying to, to you know, a make friends and 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 b try to make sure that that other people can use um, this site for for their own goals, whether that includes um, you know the, the water institute, whether it doesn't, whether it includes other members of what will be this collaborative. Um, the the real most important next step is to to 
get some collaborative effort rolling. So I have my email up there again. Um, that is that is um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop my presentation there, and I guess I will go back to the um, uh, agenda. Let me pull this back up and just put this on the screen. So we're gonna roll through a couple of different um, uh, presentations here. So I, I appreciate your attention. And we're, we're going to um, now have uh, Heidi present a little bit of the perspective from the lab that's taken place over the course of this, uh, over the course of the, the, um, uh, the project. So I will stop sharing my screen here. Okay, sh should I? let them ask questions of you or should I move on? Well, I, I think you should move on. What I, I don't think we have enough time to do like a Q&A after each okay. one. Um, right. So if you do have questions, um, everyone should just put the questions in the Q&A or in the chat at the bottom. All right. I'm just trying to get my your faces out of my way so I can <laughs> click on the on the go button of my, you know, the button where you make the full screen out. Oh, there we go, there we go. Yeah. All right. We got it. I think we got it. All right. Um, I'm sorry. I just need one more. Everybody's face is hiding my my slide. Okay. Anyway, works. here we are. We're already here. Um, so I wanted to thank Chris for getting me involved with this uh, project because I'm predominantly a lab experimentalist, but I love to go into the field um, and. Uh, this was a great opportunity to bridge between the lab and the field. And so I think Chris and I share this vision that um, the model gives, I'm sorry, the field gives you the reality and you can learn a lot in the field, but then if you bring it back in the lab, you can understand some of the details that let you then do projections into parameter space that you didn't see in the field. So that's actually really nice in the context of a design. So uh, one of the things, I'm just gonna highlight some of the ways that we are bridging between the lab and the field. And one of them is that we are using um, vegetation models in the lab that mimic vegetation in the field. So uh, on the top, you'll see these are live plants that were harvested as part of our plant accounting at the field site that Chris described earlier. Uh, we photograph them in front of pink to get a good color contrast. We digitize them, and then we can find the frontal area of the plant. And then by accumulating, counting how many plants per area we have, we can get this measurement of um, frontal area per bed area, which also is known as LAI, leaf area index. Uh, and here I'm showing the type of the cattail that is in the field, and this is a model that we um, are using in the lab that has a very similar morphology in that it's tightly, um, the leaves are tightly clustered at the bed in the comb, and then they spread out into these thin leaves at the surface. And so you see a lower frontal area at the bed and increasing away from the bed. So this is showing you the area per centimeter height as I go away from the bed is increasing, which you can see in the picture as well. And so it's similar to what we saw in the real plants. Uh, and then the alligator weed, which actually has a more uniform distribution of leaves along the stem. So you end up with, uh, this is a several alligator weeds that were harvested. Here is a, the digitized image of one of them. And here is its frontal area as a function of height and the plant that we use to model it. Again, the key factor being here is that with this plant, we're looking at a plant that doesn't have, has a fairly uniform distribution or homogeneous distribution of frontal area, whereas the taifa has a very heterogeneous distribution of frontal area. So I'm gonna mostly focus on the taifa because obviously that's more interesting. If I have a variation in frontal area, I'm gonna get a variation in velocity. Um, I can't see these words because things are covering it, but I think it says something along the lines of, we used this model canopy to study the velocity, the turbulence and the suspended sediment in, um, in this model canopy. So the canopy is actually 15 meters long. I mean, you're just seeing a very short section of the canopy. Uh, and we made velocity measurements and we also injected fine particles um, at mid depth uh, uh, at the upstream end. And then we use optical backscatter to measure profiles of the um, uh, suspended sediment distribution. Uh, 
So first of all, let's think about the velocity and the turbulence. So this little cartoon is to remind me to talk about that um, the elements of the plants, because they are rigid obstructions to the flow, they generate turbulence, and that turbulence can also interact with the bed, and that can affect resuspension in both currents and waves, but we're only considering currents right now. Uh, I'm repeating here that frontal area over depth image because I wanted to compare it to um, the velocity profile. So in this graph, I'm plotting the velocity normalized by the depth average for a bare channel without that canopy in place and with the canopy that I just showed you. Um, they have the same depth average channel velocity. For the bare bed, you can see the triangles are showing you the classic boundary layer profile, but in the vegetation, the profile is significantly different because I get higher velocity now near the bed because I have less frontal area. So the, the plants are causing the velocity to be redistributed, which could certainly have an impact on the bed shear stress uh, and also has a big impact on the turbulence. So again, these they actually have the same channel average velocity U. So um, the normalization does isn't really doing anything. But the key point is, in the vegetation, I get much higher levels of turbulence for the same velocity. Um, and that higher level of turbulence is affecting the distribution of the part of suspended particles in the water. So this graphic is the uh, suspended sediment concentration. Once it reaches the equilibrium profile, normalized by the depth average, that was the simplest way to normalize it. Uh, for different velocities here, uh, and what you see is, and the flow depth is 35 centimeters, uh, and the symbols are our measurements in this canopy. And you see near the bed where that turbulence was very high, the sediment concentration is very uniform. Uh, and then when you come above the calm region into this region with lots of smaller leaf elements, the diffusivity is actually getting a little lower. And so the suspended sediment concentration is beginning to fall off. Uh, and I think a key factor to compare that the dashed curves are showing the Rouse profile, which is the profile you would predict for the equilibrium um, suspended sediment concentration in the Bayer Channel. Um, we ran out of time because of COVID and we didn't get to do the Bayer Channel cases. So we're just gonna trust that Rouse had it right. Um, and here are, you can see, I think a key difference is that um, you get much more blending of sediment away from the bed because of the turbulence than you do with the Rouse profile. So I, I, I really wanted to illustrate this to say that the turbulence generated by the plants is also changing the distribution of the sediment, which could affect the distribution of the deposition as well. And that's one of the connections we hope to make to the field. Uh, and then now I wanted to show how we make our model for diffusivity because I'm, I'm building towards a model to examine that trend that Chris talked about is how is, what is this trade-off between the vegetation is reducing velocity, reducing supply, but also changing um, the tendencies for deposition because I'm changing the diffusivity and the turbulence. So this model up here is, uh, I think, because again, your faces are hiding it from me, um, is the diffusivity model where it's a function of a turbulent velocity scale. So that you see the turbulent kinetic energy here. Uh, and a length scale of the turbulence. So what I'm showing here, we've already looked at the turbulence and we said, oh, because the velocity is high near, near the bed, I get higher turbulence there, that makes physical sense. And here's the length scale of the turbulence. So that's sort of the typical size of the eddies. Uh, and I like showing this because it again highlights how the morphology of the plant is impacting the turbulence. Um, so all of the turbulence is very small compared to what you would see over a bare bed where some eddies are scaling you know, as large as the water depth, but really the dominant scale is about a 10th of the water depth. Now we have all the turbulence scales are a centimeter or smaller. And that is because most of this turbulence is being generated by the plants. Um, near the bed, it is on the larger scale because you could actually visually see in this little picture to the left, near the bed, sort of what I see is my solid obstruction has a larger, um, let's say diameter, then up here I have all, all the individual leaves, flow is getting in between the individual leaves, whereas down here the leaves are bundled together, so the flow only sees the bundle. So we see a change in diffusivity. So the change in length scale is also contributing to the change in the diffusivity. So here is the um, profile of diffusivity uh, that um, 
and you see that it is higher near the bed and then decaying upwards. And it is everywhere higher than it would be for the bare bed, which is the dashed line. And again, I'm using you know uh, theory here because we didn't get a chance to do measurements with a bare bed. So we wanted to wrap this all up and begin to connecting back to the field. I think that's my next slide. Yes, um, uh, I'm lazy and I didn't draw this. I apologize. I took this from Paola, but I just wanted to illustrate this idea that you know our interest is in how does sediment get onto this map marsh platform which is green, the green island here. So imagine that my model that I'm about to show you some results from, we're using what's called a random displacement model. So we're treating individual particles of sediment and we're allowing them to be affected by the mean flow and by turbulence. Um, and they can be resuspended and they can be deposited. And we're tracking them as they travel onto the marsh platform along a transect like AB. The model is actually only two dimensional, right? It doesn't actually have lateral space, but um, visually, this is what we're imagining that we're modeling. And uh, I just am going to jump to some of the results again, trying to connect to what uh, Chris was talking about earlier at the field scale. That when we think about how much sediment, how much sediment can be trapped on this marsh platform, how fast can it grow? It's going to depend on how much sediment is supplied to the marsh platform and how much of the sediment that gets in can actually end up being deposited. And of course, the concentration in the river is very important. And that is something that Chris showed how that concentration can vary seasonally. We're, we're just gonna say the concentration in the river for now is fixed. And what we're gonna vary is the density of the vegetation on the platform. Because as we vary the density, as I get more and more vegetation, less flow will go onto the platform, more will divert around Thank you, Chris Paola, for including these diversion arrows. Um, so if my velocity goes down, my supply goes down. So that's what we're going to contrast here. So here um, we're using some terminology that I think was introduced in paper by Nardin, uh, which is if I have supply restriction, that's saying that I have less sediment coming onto the platform because the velocity is reduced. So it's really just how much mass is going into the vegetation onto the platform versus how much would go on if it was completely bare. And so that mass is, you know, the concentration in the water, the width of my, you know, effectively 1D model, um, 2D model, the water depth, the velocity in the vegetation, and then some time scale over which I'm making this observation. All of these are the same except for the velocity. So what I'm really saying is as the velocity over the marsh platform is decreasing, I'm getting less and less supply. So let's look at that first. In my model, the light blue is supply restriction. It's this um, parameter uh, versus uh, planting density. As planting density is increasing, the velocity is decreasing. So my supply is going down. So the blue is going down. It goes down very rapidly initially, and then it goes down more slowly. It actually is a nonlinear relationship with vegetation density. Now, once I know how much how much um, sediment gets onto the marsh platform, I can then consider how much is actually deposited. So in the RDM model, we have an erosion, uh, we have deposition, you know, the particles are all sinking at the settling velocity, and if they touch the bed, they can deposit. Once they've deposited, they might erode, and we're using a probabilistic representation of a, of a erosion model that is a function um, of a critical velocity for erosion. So I don't have uh, time to go into this, but you, you're probably all familiar with like a critical bed shear stress. So a critical bed shear stress is normally proportional to um, some bed drag and velocity squared. So what happens when you have the vegetation is you are actually changing, as we saw the velocity profile change, you're changing the bed shear stress a little bit, and you're also introducing turbulence, which is also known to cause resuspension. So we modified that sort of classic er erosion rate equation um, to account for that turbulence. I'm not going to go into those details, but we basically say if a particle is settling, it has some probability, probability of being resuspended given the turbulence conditions that are nearby. So in the model, then we can say, what is the percent deposition? Um, so that's of the mass deposited, uh, how much mass deposits of the mass that enters. And so that is the red line. So what you see is as I get higher and higher stem density and my velocity goes down, my bed shear stress, my turbulence are both going down. So my tendency to trap is going up. So the red line is going up. 
So you have this lovely example where you have one controlling factor going down, another controlling factor going up, you would expect a nonlinear response, and that's the trapping efficiency. So if I know how much is available in the channel to be provided, so that's as if I had a bare platform, how much, how much sediment can get onto the platform, and ultimately how much is deposited, how much is retained by that platform. And it does have a nonlinear function, um, so it goes up, there's a peak, and then it goes down. So this is at least conceptually similar to what was seen on the um, at the mar at the field scale, where the change in the density was controlling the supply and causing a change in how much accretion could occur on the marsh. So as we move forward, we're going to just try more closely to make more closer connections between this modeling tool in the field. And then once we feel like the model is capturing the field correctly, we can use the model to begin to explore scenarios and try to explain, you know, how does planting density affect the availability and the deposition of particles? And certainly something that Chris and Marcel and I have talked about is that patchiness, if you remember the final video that Chris showed where you could see the vegetation was very patchy, but the tracer could go in between the patches so that when I have patchiness, when I have zones of high flow that can enter in between these patches, potentially I can deliver sediment into deeper regions of the marsh platform than if I had monolithic vegetation. And so again, we wanna look at that role of heterogeneous vegetation. And then the flip side would be, can I take advantage of intentionally planting heterogeneous vegetation to enhance this sort of penetration of sediment farther onto the marsh platform. All right, so um, I hope I'm doing okay for time. I wanna end with um, just a little, I'm just gonna throw out a little idea. I'm really excited about the, the living lab idea. Uh, I'm not by nature a field person. I love going in the field and Chris never makes fun of me when I make mistakes, so that's nice. But what I can offer is maybe opportunities to explore how to optimize planting geometry through some simple lab experiments. I mean, we can't say exactly this is the perfect way, but we could contrast, we could give good advice on contrasting ways. So Ron Bustemi shared this image with me. I thank you. I think he's gonna go into this more detail where showing some proposed lines of planting with this uh, crossbar maybe promoting some sort of shift in the flow pattern to enhance the deposition. So something we could certainly do in, in a flume in my lab would be like, well, what if we put the crossbar here? What if we put the crossbar here? Um, those kinds of questions, we could actually do comparisons and say, you know what, I think this is the best choice. Let's stick with this choice or not. Um, but I don't want to take away from the, the field. The field is absolutely the quintessential place we need to be doing these experiments. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. I know you're not allowed to ask me questions now, but definitely I'm going to stick around and, and you know, would love to have questions later on. That's great. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I, we, we are holding questions uh, until the last half hour. So please just collect your questions and I'll ask them then. Um, I, I will um, turn this over now to Ron Bassani. Um, Ron, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so Ron is gonna give a little um, uh, discussion of the LA39 project in Bay Denise, um, perhaps a little bit of how we've been able to think through leveraging that for um, some controlled experimentation at the landscape scale. So I will let, uh, let Ron go. I think- all right. Can, can I go ahead and throw up a little present? Yeah, you can share a screen here. I'll go ahead and do that. So let's see here. I believe this is it. Can y'all see that okay? It says that you started screen sharing, but I can't see. Can I, I think I see it now. Yeah, I see it now. You see it? Yep. Okay, so... Um, my name is Ron Bustani. I'm, I'm with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service out of Lafayette, Louisiana. And uh, I am officially titled a natural resources specialist, but my background is aquatic and wetlands ecology. 
Um, this, this project is, is basically a Coastal Wetlands Planning Protection Restoration Act, our QIPRA project. And um, it's part of the, uh, what's referred to as the Coastwide Vegetation Plantings uh, or the LA39, which is the number that we've given it in the QIPRA program. And uh, this was a project that we actually introduced into the program in, in uh, PPL 20, or that's the 20th year of the uh, pro pro project priority list. Um, we're actually in the 31st year this year, we're working through the 31st. So uh, this project came into introduction uh, and it's introduced into the pro program tw uh, 10 years ago. And what it, it basically did was provide an annual um, uh, ability for the program to just plant. Um, I, I Back then I was, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the environmental work group and, and one of the uh, planners for the NRCS. And we had just uh, gone through a number of hurricanes and we were faced with a situation where we wanted to try to plant areas. So people came in with candidate projects or, or ideas into the program submitted into Quipra just to go and plant areas. And uh, it, Typically, if you if you know anything about Quipper, we're not very responsive. We build big projects. A lot of these things are highly engineered, but it is a restoration program. And, and I, I thought it was time that we tried to uh, put something in there that could be responsive. So um, I federally uh, sponsored the project uh, with NRCS and uh, and, and all these projects are, are, are co-sponsored by the, the state CPRA. Um, the project manager is actually Quinn Kindler, who has proven to be an, a remarkable manager of the program. Uh, I was, I'm great at ideas and he's great at running things. So he, he was a great, great pick to run this thing because it's pretty intensive. We, we probably have about three to five projects per year that come in to plant. And there's a lot of contracting and all these things that have to go into it. And he's able to, to, to uh, masterfully, masterfully kind of maneuver through all that stuff. It's, it's not my thing as much as it is his. So, so this is uh, real important here, the goals of the project. The goals of this project, um, or this, this is the way it's described in the fact sheet, the official fact sheet of the project. Um, the goals are to facilitate a consistent and responsive planting effort in coastal Louisiana that is flexible. And I made sure that, that word flexible was in there, enough to routinely plant on a, scale, a large scale and be able to rapidly respond to critical areas of need following storm or other damaging events. So, Basically, we wanted to have something that in any given year, we could shift. We could, we could uh, if, if something happened, there could be a die off, um, there could be a hurricane impact, or in this case, which is a little bit uh, unique, is that we could plant, we were, we, we could plant an area that, that's uh, sufficient for our goals, but also it could, it could facilitate a uh, research study. So really um, this project could stand alone for what we want to do. We want to plant an area. And in fact, this project was originally just brought to us um, and proposed as a, a, a potential area to plant. And we go out and we look at these areas and we decide whether or not they work. And then uh, be, I got uh, a call from Chris and invited me on the panel. And I said, hey, why don't we, um, look at this area as a, a good research uh, location too. So uh, it kind of just parallel thinking, kind of work this out uh, to be a, a really good location to do a planting. And uh, at the same time, these, uh, Chris and his group was, was looking at this area to, to study. So uh, it, it's, a, it's just kind of the, the flexibility in this, in this planting program allows us the ability to, to do something like this. So I'm really excited about it. And um, I think it's gonna do real well. So let's take a quick look. Um, uh, 
uh, at the location. So are you seeing the uh, location there? All right, Chris? Yep, yep. We see okay, Bay Denise. Okay, so Bay Denise and, and it, what catches your eye on something like this is you see an active depositional area. This area is right off the Mississippi River. And um, we noticed uh, that this area, and we look in, routinely look for sites like this, um, where there is, it looks like these areas are de depositing a lot of material and uh, developing some uh, little bit sub, uh, they're, they're a little bit below the water surface, but um, you can catch, capture in the aerial photography a, a pretty good depositional um, event occurring. And this has been developing over, over several years now. And basically, I mean, it looks like a little mini delta forming there. So uh, for us, these kinds of environments we find to be very conducive for vegetative plantings. And so this, this project, you know, uh, going back to what the, what the group is involved in, they're looking at uh, various ways to use plants to, 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 uh, to sort of um, assist or facilitate land development, uh, restoration uh, activities that would be conducive to developing land. So, um, you know, at the same time, the, the idea of this came about by say, so, uh, the idea of using what they did at West Bay where they built a little terrace you know, they physically built a terrace, emergent terrace, to, um, to try to uh, slow down the flows coming through West Bay to capture material. And the idea there is you, you're just increasing the efficiency of, of capture and um, facilitating the development of the land there. And it seems to be working quite well. The idea here came about when the question was asked, can we use vegetation to do the same thing? And the reason is vegetation is much, much cheaper. You could get a, a few guys out there plant, you know, plant a, a, a several rows uh, without any kind of specialized equipment for very cheap. So um, this, this caught our eye as well as being uh, something that we'd be very interested in. So we, we made a trip out here and we looked at the area. And um, if, you know, what you can see when you get out there is that you can see, in fact, there is emergent vegetation uh, beginning to develop in some of this area. And you look in the background in this picture, you can see um, various uh, little um, stands of vegetation that are, are starting to pop up. And uh, what happens there, I think, is this is a um, giant cut grass. And, you know, this water might be two feet deep, but the the plants are able to, to get a little foothold. They're probably moving in on rafts of uh, water hyacinth and somehow sit there long enough to get something, get some traction and then they'll, they'll grow. So this is very typical of something that we see in a prograding environment, a new, newly developing area, some of these open water areas filling in. And it's very exciting to us because it, it's, a, it's kind of the, the, the field cue for something that's prime for some planting. So we've, this is similar to what we've seen in the Jaws and in the Cote Blanche Bay, uh, in the, the, the Little Vermilion, uh, the Little Vermilion or the Four Mile Cut down in Vermilion Bay and also Little Vermilion Terraces. They built terraces in there and in between those terraces, there was a lot of deposition. We went in and planted and you can take a look at Google Earth to see that we've had unbelievable success. So we're, we're sort of building off of some of our experiences. And uh, this, this site seems to be very conducive for the same kind of situation. So a little bit more of a close up of some of this vegetation. So cut grass we find seem, seems to put up with some of the environmental constraints we have when we do these things. Obviously depth and substrates can be challenging, but also you can have uh, large floats of um, water hyacinth that will come. You'll have beautiful growth of plants and hyacinths, will come, big rafts will come along and they'll whack them. So almost like a weed eater. And next thing you know, you don't have anything growing. So uh, we can look at the types, the, the species of vegetation. 
what takes well, and then um, work from there. But I think on this site, we're probably going to mix it with um, uh, bull whips, which is um, Scurpus californicus, very, very large, quick, quickly, rapidly developing uh, colonizing plant. And this, which is a little slower, but a little bit more hardy or resistant to some of the environmental constraints. Uh, I think that's where we, we may go. I'm going to have to talk, still, still talking to Quinn about it, but uh, we'll try to do that. So how would we do this? Well, this is conceptual. We're, we're working on the plan now, and uh, Heidi just showed you a little piece. Um, basically, what we would do is go out there and just figure out what configuration we might do that would, would colonize as quick as we can. So um, these little uh, and, and Blaise Pizzol had a lot of input into this with the Moreau Foundation. In fact, he was the one who, who brought this area to our attention originally and uh, had some sketches of some ideas. And what we were thinking here was uh, maybe a couple of um, uh, linear type features, uh, but we put a little T at the end. That came about talking in one of our advisory group panel groups. Um, to maybe put a T on the end to see if you know that might be might work well to capture sediment, but the idea here is to where we have these splays and a lot of material flow that we would introduce the organic material to start capturing that that uh, that sediment and also start to build up organic material uh, or or put down with organic material in these areas and eventually form a marsh. So. The two configurations we were looking at were uh, the little T's, and then of course, uh, we were asked if we could um, possibly do some small aerial plantings too. So we're going to look at doing some some little cubes uh, down here, and uh, that would give a, a kind of a different look that could be studied. So you could have different instrumentation and different analysis in here um, to to try to study this and. And figure out what it's doing. So we we we're we're here to uh, in this situation, uh, and our and building our flexibility to work with the group to try to build put put a design down that works both for us and and uh, you know our primary goal is putting restoration on the ground, but in this case we got a great opportunity to also advance our knowledge uh, and understanding of these types of systems. So. That's our goal here, and uh, we're, we're really excited to work with the group. Great. Thank you, Ron. Thanks yeah. for that very, very much. Um, I am so I, I am now going to share a, um, a video. I, I mentioned earlier um, that Cassidy Lejeune at um, Ducks Unlimited has a project that you'll see in a moment very closely related to the kinds of stuff that Ron was just describing, um, which is actually great because I think there's an opportunity to really leverage two separate plantings for, um, for, for similar goals and to really learn quite a bit about how they interact with the environment. Um, Cassie wasn't able to be here, but um, was able to record a video, which I am now going to attempt to show. Um, do I need to unshare this? Oh, maybe that's the oh, problem. Oh, yeah. Share. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, all right. Let me figure this up again. Okay. All right. So I will move this and I will share this screen with sound so you can hear the video. So everyone should see a screen with a. Yep, I'm seeing it. A gad wall or something on it. Um, okay, so uh, I have uh, Cassidy Lejeune here from Ducks Unlimited, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, what his organization has been doing uh, in Bay Denise as well. So Cassidy, please uh, take it away. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I appreciate uh, you guys having me today. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, but um, I'm glad at least to be able to be here uh, through this video to kind of explain to you guys what work we've done out in Bay Denise. 
Our project uh, is called the Bay Denise Delta Management NALCA project. NALCA stands for the North American Wetlands Conservation Act. It's federal funding administered through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we wrote a grant and received funding to go out and do a little over $1.2 million worth of restoration work out in Bay Denise. I'll tell you more uh, through a, a number of slides that, I, that I've prepared for you guys. First, I'll talk about the different project features. Uh, it basically included three different features, uh, one being crevasse work, the next being earthen terraces, and the last being a planting component. Uh, we completed the crevasse work and the terrace work uh, between 2000 and 2001, early 2001. Uh, and uh, at the end of it all, we ended up with uh, eight crevasses in both uh, Bay Denise and Quarantine Bay and about 2,800 linear feet of earthen terraces out in the Quarantine Bay area. In addition to that, we, we are somewhat claiming the creation of land through the beneficial use or the, the placement of the small spoil material adjacent to the crevasses uh, to the tune of about 10,000 linear feet of islands that we essentially built, segmented islands out um, in, in the Bay Denise and Quarantine Bay area. Uh, that kind of helps kind of meet our target, our goals of that, that particular NALCA grant, grant of creating habitat. And then finally, we, we, we do have a planting component. Uh, we, we actually plan to do the planting stuff uh, next month. We have a contractor lined up that's actually going out there tomorrow to do a uh, field recon to check out the site and, and, and do a little bit of legwork in preparation for the planting stuff that will happen in June. Uh, but we're going to plant two different species of plants, uh, the cut grass and bulrush, uh, about 2,600 plants each. It'll be two inch plugs and uh, it'll happen over the course of probably two to three days. I'll show you guys uh, kind of a map of these different project features. Uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, Bay Denise, the Mississippi River, and Quarantine Bay. And like I mentioned previously, we built uh, six crevasses, which are shown in these lines here, out in Quarantine Bay. We built that small terrace field out in Quarantine Bay as well. And then uh, we built two crevasses out into Bay Denise, as you can see here on the map. And the kind of darker lines next to it is where we we kind of place the spoil material again to create islands out in open water. Uh, this area is, is is very dynamic. It's changing. It's very much influenced by the Mississippi River. There's a lot of fresh water and sediment that's running through these these channels and these cuts, and and a lot of sediment that's naturally being deposited from the river out into these areas. So it's changed quite a bit since we started this project about five years ago or so. Uh, it, uh, our planning stuff, uh, stuff we did a few years ago was irrelevant by the time we actually went to construction because it's so dynamic. Uh, and you'll see that through the pictures that I share with you guys, you'll see how this, this Bay Denise area really has, has developed as a result of this cut becoming more wider and deeper over time. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're looking to enhance habitat out there. We're looking to take kind of deeper open water and make it into a, a variety of habitat conditions, including shallow water areas, mud flats, aquatic vegetation beds, emergent marsh and, and, and sandbars, just, just have good diversity, which is good for fish and wildlife. This is kind of like our, our project timeline. Uh, again, we wrote a grant, NALCA grant. Uh, we secured those funding, the funding for the project back in 2017. It took a little while for us to get the project going because we had to get it through the permitting process. We also had some, some oyster leases that we had to extinguish via the help of uh, CPRA. Uh, this area is not good oyster habitat, but there were some leases that had to be uh, uh, purchased to for us to move forward with the work. In 2019, we bid out the project and awarded the project to Diamond Services Corporation. Uh, those guys started in January 2020 and completed everything but the planting stuff in January 2021. The reason why it took a full year is we did have some issues with high river and hurricanes that actually caused the contractor to demob off the job for a while and then come back to finish it up later. Uh, all the all the logos down here at the bottom of the slide are basically giving credit to all of our partners that were involved in this, uh, you know, financially, uh, you know, logistical support, um, you know, big, big uh, uh, help to this was Ryan Lambert with Cajun Fishing Adventures. This was kind of his his project, his concept that uh, 
that he put together. But a lot of people kind of came together and uh, and ended up delivering this project. And again, it was over one point two million dollars worth of funding from all of all of the partners combined. Here are just some pictures, Chris, of, of uh, construction. This is a picture in the Quarantine Bay area right when they first started back in January 2020. It's large drag line, bucket dredge. Uh, this is just showing them uh, starting to dig the crevasse out into Quarantine Bay. Here's an aerial shot of uh, crevasse construction in Bay Denise. This is the southern crevasse in Bay Denise. Uh, and as you can see, he's uh, he's digging in front of the barge and placing the material off to the side. The objective of this was to to connect uh, a cut uh, on the southeast side to a cut on the kind of southwest side and try to get more river flowing out into the open water areas of Bay Denise. You can kind of see in this top picture, actually, this little this bayou here is kind of plugged off at the mouth of it. So the plan was to try to open it back up and really try to get a lot of volume of water uh, flowing out into the deeper areas of Bay Denise. Typical crevasses were about 60 feet wide and about uh, dug down to about a minus eight foot depth. This is uh, after construction of the, the picture you were just looking at, the location. That drag line was actually sitting probably about right here where my cursor is. Uh, he was digging there and placing on this, this spall bank. Uh, but this crevasse uh, was cut all the way out into the deeper water areas of Bay Denise. Next, this is the other crevasse in, in Bay Denise. On the north side of Bay Denise, you can see the land that we built through the placement of spoil material. This is the actual crevasse that was cut uh, to deliver fresh water and sediments out into the deeper waters of Bay Denise. And essentially, the objective of all this is to try to create this type of habitat out in open water. With the wetland loss that we're experiencing in coastal Louisiana, you got to take advantages of opportunities like this where nature is doing a really good job of, uh, of, of building land and, and creating wetlands. And, uh, and we just kind of came in to say, well, let, let's try to accelerate that process, enhance that process, and, and punch more holes to get more fre fresh water and sediment out there to, to make it happen a little bit quicker. As I mentioned earlier, this this area is so dynamic. When we started this project, this this large uh, delta wasn't actually here. This large cut really wasn't there. It actually had kind of wrapped around like this uh, rather than punching through the Bay Denise. But as I said, this cut's getting so deep and so wide that it really has changed the landscape and created this this beautiful natural delta that's that's formed out in the middle of the lake. Here's a picture of another crevasse, just a completed crevasse. This is where we dug. This is where we placed the spoil and created the, 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 the segments to allow tidal exchange to happen uh, behind the, the spoil banks. Uh, and then off in the distance, you could actually see a few of our smaller crevasses on the other side of Bay Quarantine and the terraces out in open water. Here's a ground shot of the terraces during construction. Typical terrace configuration, about 55 feet wide, about 10 foot crown on the top, and built to about a plus three foot elevation. And just so you know, the spoil banks uh, that we built were up to about a five foot elevation. So you have a comparison. They were just a, a foot or two higher than, than the terraces. Uh, grand total, 2,800 uh, linear feet of terraces that we built. There were they were each 200 foot sections or segments. So basically 200 foot wide little islands. Uh, uh, very typical stuff of what you see uh, with terrace configurations and construction. But the cool thing about this one is we, we are essentially building terraces out on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico, um, out in open water. Uh, again, like I said, the, the, the river is, is building, uh, building up this area so rapidly, it, it allows us to do that kind of thing. This is just a kind of a shot of the, the, the crevasses. You could see the crevasses that we cut to try to try to feed that that terrace field. The idea behind the terraces to kind of help trap some of that sediment that's that's flowing through those crevasses. We did have a little bit of a complexity in the project in that we had some large pipelines on these this side of the crevasse between the cut and the and the crevasses. Uh, but we were able to kind of create these channels just past the pipeline to try to get water moving further out into the open water areas. And the whole idea behind this was to kind of mimic what they did at uh, the Fort St. Philip 
Delta Management Quipper Project, which is right next door. Uh, this is just uh, adjacent to Beta Nice. Beta Nice is actually right in here. Uh, this is some work that was done through Quipra, large scale, larger scale Quipra project that included terraces and crevasses. And as you can see over time, uh, uh, really, this area has really filled in as a result of the work. And uh, that we, we kind of use this as a as a mold or a guide for what we were trying to accomplish in, in the Bay Denise and Quarantine Bay area, just at a larger scale, at a smaller scale, sorry. And then finally, here's just a, a, another aerial shot, a drone shot of, of the terraces. This is a, you know, a low tide and you can really see how how sediments are already being accumulated. It's already a shallow bar. There's already vege vegetation that's getting established. We're just trying to expand that out further out into open water by creating these crevasses and, and uh, building these terraces. You can actually see some sediment uh, starting to kind of fall out behind the terraces. Finally, I'll talk about the planting component of it. Uh, we do plan, again, like I mentioned earlier, to go out and stick some plants in the ground. Uh, we plan to, to put out about 32 different 500 foot segments of plants it's single rows, uh, about 100 plants per uh, per row, and uh, we look to do like a five-foot spacing on these plants, essentially just planting in shallow water, planting those two-inch plugs in, in, in the shallowest areas we can find. This is just kind of a conceptual map showing what we're proposing to do next month, but this is that crevasse in Bay Denise. We're just looking to uh, put out these plants in 500-foot segments, like I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, using both cut grass and, and bulrush. We, we tried to lay these out in, in a variety of locations. We're hoping that it might be in a variation of water depths and in areas that have a, a variable amount of flow. Uh, just to point out, you can see some of these segmented gaps in the spoil banks where we feel that some of this water might be flowing through here and hopefully these plants could kind of help trap some sediment similar to what the terraces are doing on the other, other side of the project area. Here's another example in, in uh, Bay Denise. This is actually a natural cut that's going out in the Bay Denise, but there is a, a, a shoal, shoaling that's happening that we, we just kind of randomly decided, well, let's try a little bit here, let's try a little bit there, and, and so on. And finally, this is the kind of northern end of Bay Denise that I showed you a picture of earlier. Again, we're just looking at kind of in an experimental way, just trying different things to see what might work. Uh, you know, planting some some bulrush, you know, kind of in the outfall of some of these little cuts and then maybe planting some uh, cut grass kind of further out on the flat. Uh, again, uh, th there's plants happening, plants uh, becoming establ uh, established naturally out here. Uh, this picture was taken on a low tide during winter, and I can guarantee you that today it looks a lot different than this. There's probably plants popping up all over the place as we speak. But again, it, it's happening naturally. We're just looking to kind of accelerate that process and and uh, get get the most bang for the buck and and uh, getting plants in the in what we think might be the best situations uh, to try to help trap some sediments. And really, that's it, man. That's all I have uh, for for today. Uh, that's kind of a summary in a nutshell of what we've done and what we plan to do at Bay Denise. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. That's great. Thank you, Cassie. That was really interesting. I appreciate that. That was that was a really nice overview. Um, we have uh, to stay in schedule about a, just a little over a minute, but I, I do have a couple of questions and then other other folks are certainly welcome to ask uh, questions of your, your colleague, Mike, who is going to be at the meeting tomorrow. Um, but I, I guess my 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 first uh, uh, question was about the the vegetation. I, I'm I'm particularly interested in the placement strategies that you used, and if you had any um, any sort of method or what was the thinking behind placing the vegetation where you placed it, and uh, how'd you go about making those choices? Yeah, where yeah. You will yeah, I'm happy to answer that. And, and and like you said, Mike Carlos will be on the call tomorrow and can can talk more about this project. He's very knowledgeable about it. But uh, just, man, in, a, in the simplest way, we were just trying different things. Uh, we just we had some money. We had about thirty thousand dollars to go finish up the project and put some plants on the ground and just felt, well, let's let's try a little bit here. Let's try a little bit there. Let's see what works, what doesn't work. 
through the use of aerial imagery over the course of the next few years. But it, it just was kind of just haphazardly kind of put together and saying, let's let's try this, that, and the other. Uh, we, we really didn't have much science behind it. I uh, just figured these two plants are commonly used and uh, mm -hmm. they're readily available and can be put out there uh, with with, uh, you know, minimal effort and and uh, figured it would be a, a good shot at seeing what works and what doesn't work. Gotcha. No, I completely agree. I'm really excited to see that move forward. All right. Well, I appreciate it. we are out of time for this. So I'm going to stop the recording and uh, thank Chris, you're muted. You're muted, Chris. Oh, it was very interesting what I was saying. Um, so <laughs> I, I was just saying uh, uh, thank you, Cassidy, which felt a little bit odd because he wasn't here. But um, I, Cassidy's colleague, uh, Mike, is actually on the line. So if anyone wants to ask him questions during the Q&A, um, uh, please feel free. That um, the, the last two presentations, one from Ron and one from Cassidy, are both about active restoration efforts within Bay Denise. And those are the kinds of things that I'm really hoping that this, this living lab um, is able to interact with. And I, I, and I, I, I just want to point out briefly that I, I think that there's a lot of variability already in the thoughts of how to deploy the vegetation and, um, and how to sort of uh, sculpt the landscape that Dux is doing. Um, that I think is really ripe for interaction with some, some experimentalism. So that's something to come back to later um, but now I'm going to, um, uh, is, uh, is, Jack, is Jacqueline next? I don't have my agenda, I think you are. The next three, um, three presentations are all from um, people in the practitioner advisory panel um, who were uh, really tasked with, a, um, with an activity where we were looking to design a couple of experiments inside of what might become a Bay Denise Living Lab and just hypothesize about the types of activities that we could uh, we could do there. So I think Jacqueline's going to talk a little bit um, a about her students and how her students may interact, and, and b about um, sediment retention strategies. Then uh, Emily is going to talk a little bit about ecology and species diversity and how you might experiment with that in this kind of situation. And then Maddie's going to talk a bit about. Um, uh, um, carbon sequestration and how we might um, play around with that at a sort of landscape scale experiment. And then we will go to the q and I really um, appreciate everyone. So let me, um, oh, I guess Jacqueline, you can just share yourself. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Chris. So um, as Chris mentioned, I'm Jacqueline Richard. I'm the Department Head of Science and Associate Professor of Geology at Fletcher Technical Community College uh, in Schriever. Um, and today I'm kind of tasked to present two things, as Chris mentioned. First, our, uh, I'm going to talk about our experiment design, which was a really a wonderful thought process. Uh, and as an educator, I really love what Chris kind of put forth for us to walk through that. And then I'm going to discuss uh, how my students can kind of work into this or students in general, and then maybe some ideas for future work, because uh, there's a lot of doors here that can be opened. So first, I want to discuss our uh, thought experiment here. And uh, we were tasked with sediment delivery and retention. So here you see uh, the image that you've seen previously with some lovely colored dots on it. Uh, so here we have the LA39 project uh, with the, the plantings there uh, in Bay Denise. And our uh, null hypothesis that we wanted to uh, test was that there's no difference between uh, sediment, uh, sedimentation and compaction between uh, say the BS11 site with your traditional terracing and then um, the proposed LA39 project using softer vegetation to, to trap that sediment accumulation. So um, in looking at this, we have our BS11, which is our engineered morphology over here. And then, of course, we have, as Cassidy just talked about, the, um, the Ducks Unlimited terraces uh, that are there. And then, of course, the plantings that are going to be in place. So we thought it would be great to test to see which morphology uh, would, would be better, if there is one, uh, between the terraces and the softer vegetation for uh, trapping sediment. So what we have here are two different colored dots. We have our yellow dots and our red dots where our yellow dots will test um, flow rate, right? Flow into the bay and out of the bay. 
And then uh, our red dots are to test sediment compaction uh, and sedimentation rates. So um, just to kind of walk you through a little bit of this before I dive into uh, our students or my students. Um, over here in BS11, uh, this is already obviously an established site, but you can see that we have, you know, a sediment inflow down here at this is crevasse 1B and then a sediment outflow up here, uh, or water outflow up here. And then these two red dots um, located within the terrace field, we propose that we can, you know, test what's going on there with the sediment, uh, sedimentation and compaction. And then compare that to these areas that are outside of the terrace field to see what the difference is right between those and, and establish a baseline right, for what, what is occurring there. And then we would take that model and propose it over here in Bay Denise, um, which is pretty interesting because as you see, we have two different planting designs here. And in addition of these, um, these are quarter acre plots of uh, vegetation um, down here on the Southern end. So down here, we have these quarter acre plots that's going to allow for um, water and sediment to move across it, right? But the, as you heard earlier from Heidi, the uh, vegetation can be dense enough to trap some of that sediment. So we have uh, red dots outside of that location again to kind of get a base, uh, a base sampling and then uh, on either side of those plots to see how the sediment is moving through there. And then of course we have um, measurements that we can take back here uh, as well to see how those plantings are trapping the sediment. And then uh, over here on the Western side, same thing, right? We can test, uh, measure the, the flow rates coming in there. And then of course, those red dots outside of the planting field and then inside. Um, as Chris talked about, you know, these, these would be great locations for uh, potentially putting platforms to have students come out and regularly test. Um, you see that there's some red dots out here just kind of floating out in the nether space in the bay. Um, that would be to, to test what's going on in the deeper parts of the bay, right? Is, is sediment being moved that way? How is it moving across there? How is it depositing? Is it depositing? Is it just moving through? Um, so there's definitely a lot of possibilities uh, with this. And I wanna um, talk about how students can uh, come into this. So just to give you a couple little beautiful pictures here to stare at while I talk about uh, all the beautiful things that I think could happen here uh, with the education. So the educational benefits of tying into an experiment, experiment such as this or having platforms out there where students can regularly go test is we find that it's really important at Fletcher to train the next generation of coastal workers whether it's people that are moving on to university and PhD, or it's you know, individuals that wanna learn how to drive an airboat, right? Or you know, uh, take these measurements for wildlife and fisheries. So we're operating at all levels here. And we also know that across the state, there is a problem with students uh, leaving the state of Louisiana for other uh, career opportunities. So we wanna enhance um, enhance them staying here and get them trained so they can get out into the field uh, and, and deploy these practices. And something like a living lab in Bay Denise would absolutely be a beautiful training ground um, for this. So there's definitely a benefit to talking about this in the classroom. As we all know, most of us here are formally trained. We've all gone through these exercises, but as we know, you don't really learn until you're out there in the field. Um, and so we have actually developed an environmental science program um, at Fletcher as well as a geology program. But as far as our um, environmental science program goes, uh, we do have a field methods course um, that we are currently designing, which I was very excited when Chris brought me into the fold on this project because uh, we are designing this course uh, with industry and university partners. So we can actually design this course to bring students out there to test what's needed, right, in Bay Denise as the living lab, say, grows and changes with undergraduates and graduate students. Um, we know that getting students out there to, you know, test what you saw in the previous slide, uh, whether it's using flow meters or feldspar markers or beryllium isotope markers or sedimentation tiles, you can learn about that all day in the book, but until you're out there actually practicing it, um, that's when it becomes really critical. And this gives students uh, a leg up when they're applying for jobs um, because they've already had the experience. They don't need to be trained um, by an employer to do so. So it definitely gives some of our local um, students more of a leg up in getting those jobs. Um, as I mentioned, um, 
as we move forward with these courses, uh, whether it's that field methodology course or you know, I have great love for all of my geology courses and my coastal restoration course that I'm also teaching. Um, the beautiful part about having a living lab out there is students can gather their own data um, for class projects. It also allows me to um, develop projects and have students go out there to test different methodologies as it's changing. Um, you know, textbooks change and evolve over time, just like you saw with, with the Delta and with all of these, as you heard Cassidy talk. And this allows us that flexibility um, to teach students that science isn't static, right? It's going to move and it's going to change. And it really exposes them to that. And that's really uh, an eye opener, right? When you get into the science field. Um, it also gives the students the opportunity to meet graduate students uh, in the region and uh, help them with their projects as well. And, you know, even just kind of thinking forward, this allows students to potentially, uh, what I would love to personally do, is have poster presentations uh, every semester about the data they gather. Let's make something meaningful of it and uh, have them do a poster presentation like they would do at a scientific um, meeting. And it exposes them to that process and gives them experiments with that presentation. And now moving forward, just a, just a, a brief note, because I can't, I can't just leave that door closed without future work. Um, in designing both um, materials for our students and as you saw that sediment retention uh, piece, you know, this allows students to have different kind of thought processes like backwards design, right? As we look at this bay, what do we want this bay to look like at the end, right? Where do we want the passes? Where do we want the duck ponds? And this allows the students to kind of experiment with how do we get that there? It allows them that process of, of testing. Uh, it allows them to look at shreds for uh, steering sediment, right? Not just capturing, but how do we steer the sediment the way it goes? There's a lot of complex problems uh, that we can expose the students to. As you know, as I've been out there, there's quite a few structures and duct lines that are already actually capturing sediment behind them. How do we use that, right? How do we incorporate all of that into our models? Um, how can we move forward with that? Can we design different shreds? Uh, whether it's a floating barge structure or using storm generated vegetation or bamboo and pallets, right? We can test that in our flume uh, that hopefully we're gonna get our, at our, uh, in our new beautiful coastal restoration lab. Um, and then of course, obviously, how do we use the vegetation that's already there? As, as noted already, there's lots of willow out there. How do we use that locally sourced willow to help uh, gather this sediment? So I'm, uh, I'll leave it there. I could probably ramble for a lot longer. I'm a professor, I'm great at doing that. Um, but uh, again, I appreciate this opportunity to uh, be pulled into the fold and to be able to pull my students into this amazing opportunity with the Living Lab. Thank you, Chris. Great, great, thank you. That, that all looks like it would be delightful, really fun. Um, let's um, and move to Emily. Uh, Fire is gonna tell us a little bit about this as a, sample experiments into ecology of a place like this and how you might design an experiment around these plantings. Can you guys see that screen? Yes. Okay, um, okay cool. So thanks, Chris. So um, my name is Emily Farr. I'm a, a plant ecologist and a microbial ecologist at Tulane. And so I wanted to take a couple minutes to describe kind of what our kind of ecology group talked about when we were tasked with um, doing some experiments um, looking from an ecology perspective at this uh, restoration site. So one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in, I think about a lot is biodiversity. And um, I came to Louisiana uh, five years ago to start at Tulane and I'm new to the area. And one of the things that kind of struck me um, about the restorations in the wetlands here is that they're typically very low diversity. Typically, you know, restorations are one species, maybe two species like the ones that um, Cassidy talked about with the Ducks Unlimited. Um, so that was exciting, exciting to even see two species. So, um, but I think that, um, plant diversity uh, could actually improve sediment trapping, it could improve habitat quality, and it could improve the overall um, functioning of these marsh restorations. Um, and this is because different plant species have different traits, right? Some are broad leaves, some are narrow leaves, some grow in clumps, some grow um, very sparsely, you have long rhizomes, um, some have deep roots, some have shallow roots. And so I think all of these different plant traits could really complement each other to maybe increase sediment trapping, retain sediment, reduce erosion, um, and, and do the things that we, and enhance the things that we want to enhance in these marshes. Um, the other thing, there's a lot of um, 
literature that shows that higher diversity systems with higher plant diversity mean more biomass production. So that has important implications for things like carbon sequestration and just the um, accretion or buildup of organic matter in situ kind of produced by the marsh. Um, but all of these ideas need to be tested in, in place. And so, because we don't really know how much diversity matters, you we need one species, two species, 10 species, um, or which particular species might complement each other the best. Um, so what our group kind of talked about was proposing this um, pretty simple experimental design, kind of utilizing those T formations um, that are already in the, uh, in the, the design of the, the restoration planting. Um, but instead maybe um, put in these larger blocks that within these larger blocks would have um, an experiment um, manipulating diversity. So we would have some, some patches, you know, these would be like five by five meters, 10, 10 meters, where we would plant only one, uh, one species, these monoculture plantings, um, plots where we would plant pairs of species, different pairs of species, plots where we would plant three species or maybe four species, which would might, might be our max. Um, and then in each of these individual plots, um, we can measure all, all the things we're interested in, like accretion and flow rates, um, soil carbon, um, biomass accumulation. Uh, we would also want to measure plant composition um, to look at how these different diversity mixtures might change in composition over time. I mean, it might be that these higher diversity mixtures, um, maybe they would actually promote the colonization of even other plant species. So diversity would be get more diversity. Um, so these are all things in, that we could we could test. Um, we could also situate, um, kind of like the design here, we could situate these, these experimental units across the landscape um, in different locations. So some would be more closely, um, close to the, the input, the flow input, some might be farther out into the deeper water. And it might be that different pairs of species or different combinations of species would work better in different places on the landscape. Um, and so understanding that and where the placement of different species should go um, is really important to test. Um, and then lastly, the, the, uh, some of the other kind of biological features we would want to measure are, are things like invertebrate diversity. Invertebrates are really important as the base of the food chain if we're interested in birds and ducks and, and other animals. Um, I'm a microbial ecologist, so I'd like to look at microbial diversity. You know, is, is, an import, is a plant diversity important for um, having the most uh, diverse microbial community that could you know, enhance nutrient cycling and delivery of more nutrients to plants. Microbes are obviously also important in wetlands for things like denitrification and methane production. So things you wanna keep track of in terms of ecosystem, um, how the ecosystem is functioning. Um, so that's kind of how, that's kind of the, the experiment that we designed. We were really interested. There's lots of other directions we could go in, but I think um, it's pretty a pretty simple uh, kind of thing that we could do to manipulate diversity in these in these restoration plantings in Bay Denise and, and see, um, and you know, test this hypothesis of whether these diverse plantings would kind of um, maximize uh, what we want out of this this restoration. So that's all I have. Um, and can share. Nice. Thank you, thank you very much. I love the red flowers, kind of marsh poppy looking plants that you had in there. I try. <laughs> <laughs> Madeline Foster Martinez, you are the last uh, presenter today. If you're talking, you might be muted. Yeah, sorry, trying to get myself set up here. Just, just a moment. Uh, let me. We can sorry see your screen. Oh. Now I gotta swap it one more time. There we go. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'll keep this brief. Uh, my name is Maddie Foster Martinez, and I work at the University of New Orleans. And so, um, you know, we just saw this, uh, the Bay Denise Living Laboratory as this excellent opportunity to think about uh, carbon sequestration and to uh, better understand all of the ways that carbon, uh, all the different pathways that carbon is taking uh, through the system. Um, so here's a, a quick sketch looking at, at some of those. Um, but what's really powerful about working with these, um, working with restoration practitioners um, is that we can think about how the restoration planting schemes can be leveraged to enhance the carbon sequestration. And so I'm referring to planting schemes, but it's kind of everything that we've been talking about, whether or not that's the different types of species and different arrangements 
Um, so this definitely fits in with all the other uh, experiments that have been described so far. So, you know, rather than asking questions that are just um, confined to, you know, how much of the plant biomass is exported versus staying within the system, um, we can take more of uh, what, what I think is, is really neat and kind of more of an engineering perspective of well, which planting schemes trap more biomass and maximize uh, the carbon sequestered. So I think these are really, you know, powerful questions that allow us to get the most out of um, all of these different interventions that we're putting on the landscape. Um, and of course, we not only want to look at carbon and biomass, um, but also examine, you know, ideally we would be able to examine all greenhouse gases here. So, um, you know, methane has come up uh, as well as uh, nitrous oxide. We'd want to understand what the nutrient cycling is um, that's going on in the system. And again, uh, but not just what's happening, but how these different planting schemes um, could potentially, you know, for example, minimize the methane production. So everything um, that Heidi was referring to about um, how the, the effect of the vegetation on the flow, how it changes the diffusivity, the velocity profiles, all of those things can also impact um, the biogeochemical cycling occurring and therefore you know, the greenhouse gas production. So we have this opportunity to really leverage the plantings, um, use them as a potential control to help maximize uh, the carbon sequestered and minimize uh, the greenhouse gas production. Um, so uh, we didn't have such a, you know, uh, quite the, the laid out scheme, but just some of the techniques that we might use to do this um, on the, the smaller scale on like the, the uh, plot scale, we could put out some static chambers and floating chambers, analyzing um, what some of that, that, those gas fluxes are. I think other people have talked about, you know, the sediment and the biomass measurements that we would also want to be making. Um, but this is something kind of different that speaks to that greenhouse gas component. Um, and then at the landscape scale, we'd be interested in putting out um, eddy flux towers that allow us to examine all of the, the fluxes coming from uh, this area. They have different footprints, um, kind of depending on what the wind conditions are, um, but we could put out multiple flux towers uh, within you know, these different plantings to understand what impact they're having on um, the gas production. And that would uh, really help uh, enhance these, um, the use of these environments you know, for carbon sequestration um, moving forward. So uh, that's it for me. I just uh, you know, really wanna emphasize what a cool opportunity this is to work with restoration practitioners so that we can really um, best leverage you know, the human influence that's already happening on the landscape, but best leverage it for, um, for all of the best outcomes. And uh, again, I think that this really, you know, all these experiments really fit in really well with each other. Um, and so we can, um, you know, use them to, to best design our adaptive management strategies um, moving forward. So thank you. I'm trying to keep us on time. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thank you very much. That was really great. Thank you um, to all the presenters, I guess. And I never know what to do here, but if people want to I don't know, unmute and show and maybe a little round of applause or something like that. Um, I really appreciated that. That was extremely interesting um, through and through. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, in the, so what time is it? We're, we're at 2.46, so we're not too far behind. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, uh, uh, Agnit Mitro uh, Chakrabarty, uh, thank you very much. Those are really fantastic questions, and, and maybe those will be the first set um, that that we ask here. I'll, I'll sort of pose them um, as we go to the panelists for discussion. Um, we we actually also so anyone else who wants to ask uh, questions of any of the the members, please feel free to to drop them in the in the chat. I, I wonder if it makes more sense to, to simply un, unmute people. Um, I, I believe um, I can do that. Um, so I, I think now I, I'm happy to ask the questions you asked as well, um, uh, Agni, uh, Agni Mitra, but um, you are now, I believe, unmuted. So if, if you want to pose, you had one for Ron and Cassidy and then one for Heidi and then one for me. Uh, maybe you want to ask them in, in your own voice. Right. Uh, so, uh, Ron, and I think uh, 
please answer my question. I don't know whether that was the answer to my question or another question. Uh, but what I wanted to understand was, uh, did you consider or did you take any surveys of the typical velocities exiting these crevasses uh, or these um, any, any of these channels before you planted the plant species or you chose the plant species for that location? Uh, based on a, I'm just thinking in terms of a, a mortality standpoint, that will they be able to take uh, the velocities? Because uh, at mid battery year, where uh, we are working actually, uh, in terms of it's a proposed project and we are doing the modeling for that, um, the, the exit velocities from that outfall, it's basically a 75,000 CFS flow. So it's much larger flow than any of the current diversion sites. So uh, one of the questions is the mortality of the vegetation. And uh, this question I'm trying to ascertain whether this is a viable thing around that outfall at all, or this is something it requires. Like typically two feet per second is the NRCS guideline for vegetation survival. So uh, did you consider that? Uh, that's a great question. I, I uh, you know, we went out there on a pretty high flow and got you know when we were taking a look at the uh the area and it, it wasn't at the time that we were there it looked like it would be anything of concern you know like where where it could really just uh rip up the plants but uh typically when we do these these plantings we're gonna uh, mainly uh look at bathymetry you know look at the depth and and see if it's suitable to to uh to to basically grow the plants um i mean you don't want anything much more than about a foot and a half foot you know foot and a half to a foot deep and uh and especially when it's accreting uh that would be um a great opportunity to do it but you know i, I we're going to probably do uh, another survey prior to the to the final analysis before we actually go out and plant and um that's a good question i I, I wasn't really in tune to uh, looking at velocities at the time, but it's definitely a consideration. Um, I think that we should probably pay attention to some of these areas, these flat areas that we uh, we were looking at, didn't seem to have much, you know, much flow over them where where you had the main channel where it was kind of running through. Um, it, it seems like you know, these areas sort of eddy out and they start to drop out sediments. It's a little bit more conducive to grow plants. Um, but I, I really, I, I hadn't considered that before. Got it, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 just to add to what Ron was saying, I, I answered the question for him and uh, I, I left some other kind of things that we looked at at the site, but it, it was definitely a lot more slack water than the actual channel. Um, but, you know, normally on a site when we go assess, we're looking at what's the parts per thousand, you know, the salinity there and what, what kind of vegetation is already in place um, that we see thriving or at least has a foothold. Um, and then, you know, this is a federal program, so you do have constraints as far as which plants you put there. Um, we, we have a, a specifications on, on certain wetland plants that are normally used. Uh, to slow down or stop erosion. So that's that's one constraint of the program. Got it, you know. Thanks. Um, I, 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 you, you also had a question for uh, a hiding. Right. That... right, and uh, this one uh, is a little bit more uh, related to the laboratory stuff probably, but um, I was trying to understand and this, uh, I haven't seen many papers on this, but if you have uh, both bed forms, sandy bed forms and vegetation, I guess uh, we are not looking for those environments right in South Louisiana, but say uh, you're looking at an uh, outfall, a crevasse outfall from a river with a high sediment load or high sand load, let's say, and we want to have marshes growing on there or have some plantings there. Um, in general, um, uh, my question is both in terms of experiment as well as modeling, uh, what is the, understanding that are the deposition effects uh, similar to what we would see like in a sim simple sandy bed form or uh, will the- What scale of bed form are you imagining? Like dunes uh, or you mean like the entire bank? Uh, like say a few meters. Uh, it will so be- 
if you yeah. if you have dunes of a meter scale and vegetation charts growing on them um the the feedback between what forms the dune is going to change because well right. so on multiple different scales so like the vegetation drag can actually change eliminate say the say the separation on the back face of the dune because of the drag so you're going to you could change the whole dynamic of the dune i mean this isn't studied very carefully but there's certainly evidence from terrestrial literature, um, how, you know, hills with different levels of vegetation, tree drag, have different um, wake structures. Uh, so I'm not sure what scale you're talking about. We also see in rivers that when you plant on like a point bar, you will transition from without vegetation, the point bar can have migrating dunes and with the vegetation, the migrating dunes no longer exist. So they're, they're, I think it's not, I can't say, specifically that one or the other always trumps. I think that there's examples where the vegetation is more important in ultimately dictating the flow and potentially changing the bed forms. Um, and and other, but I just think there's lots of other, other um, scenarios to consider before I can make a blanket statement. Got it. Yeah, yeah. but I, I, would, I would say um, with regards to like, like islands, like the way a larger scale island, say on the on the scale of twenty to fifty meters, right? So so that island is becoming shallower, and so the velocity is becoming less. In the same way that adding vegetation adds drag, and the velocity becomes less. So those have a, a similar behavior with regards to affecting the spatial distribution of velocity, shallowing and adding vegetation drag, but they might have a different effect in terms of the near bed turbulence. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I, I'm aware of uh, papers in like aeolian forms where they yeah. consider vegetation and drag and dunes. Yeah. But I haven't seen much in the water field. So I was wondering whether your lab is working on something like this or. Yeah. Something. So, so we, the, um, we, I've done work on, uh, do you know Saffel, St. Anthony Falls Laboratory? Yes. Yeah. So they have this large outdoor stream lab okay. that that's like a, a meandering stream that we did experiments on point bars, planting point bars. So that that's the yeah. only case okay. we have done anything at that scale. We we observe in the lab. Here's another example where there's an interference. So when you in the lab, we looked at um, wave induced ripples. So mm -hmm. if you have vegetation that is sparse enough, right? And so it comes down to um, the, the relative length scales of like the wave excursion and the spacing right. between the plants, you can form ripples. And if the ripples form, the turbulence generated by the ripples are more important to resuspension than the, than the plants. But if it, it's an interesting feedback because if the vegetation is denser and, and interferes with the formation of the ripples and you don't get the ripples, then it's the vegetation turbulence that's dominating the resuspension. Exactly. So, so it's exa exactly. it's definitely a, uh, uh, the vegetation density is, is controlling when you flip between one and the other. So cool. I would expect a similar thing if, if in, um, with, 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 Uniform current, you can also form ripples, but we haven't we haven't studied that quite as much with realistic vegetation. So I I don't want to say anything specific about that. Got it. Got it. I mean, uh, simplistically speaking, I mean, in Bessin scale models, uh, most folks would use some kind of a roughness length to flip between one and the other. Which one is more dominant? And yeah, uh, yeah, I know, I know, and I feel like we're not going to break people of that habit. So I'm more of an advocate of if you if you can get the right um, mean velocity field, then, yeah. then, then we can, we can provide you with subgrid scale representations of what the turbulence should be. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll, uh, send you an email and we can discuss. Yeah, that. sure. Sure. Okay. Great. Yeah. That's an interesting question in a lot of contexts. Um, thank you for asking. That was really interesting. Um, and I, I guess I, I will say there was one other question to me, which was, um, did I collect or characterize sediment type on the mud flat and the channel? Um, the answer is that it's, it's, it's better characterized on the mud flat and it's, it's sort of a medium to coarse silt for the most part. We found some sorting of silt sizes um, along the transect from the edge of the channel going into the mud flat. Um, going in, we didn't go too much more than uh, 
I, I think 50 meters was about as far as we went. And there's quite a bit more mudflat beyond that. So I think we could have gotten to some much finer grain sizes if we had gone, but it takes a it 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 would have it would have taken a lot of walking and uh, we we uh, we stepped on a couple alligators and didn't didn't get quite that far, um, but we 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 don't have at least from this study many samples from the the bed of the channel though we do have that from um, previous studies uh, that I did maybe eight or ten years ago in the same area and what was interesting in the channel is some of the channel is actually. Um, I, I mean, some of it has has sand grains, so like 125 micron ish or something like that, maybe 100, 150, but it's fairly fine. Um, and some areas of the bed are actually completely devoid of alluvial cover at all. And when you take a grab sample, you're sampling into relatively consolidated um, uh, like silty clay deposits, which can't be too old because we were in Cubitt's Gap, which really isn't that old. So I, you know, I think that that it was incising into some former, um, you know, sort of internally splayed area. Um, but it's, it's, it's fairly difficult to characterize the sediment in the, in the bed of the channel in that way. Got it. Thanks, Chris. That makes perfect sense. Did you have any kind of waves at, that, at this location at uh, any point? Or is this a wave dominated area? No, not many. I mean, I won't say we didn't have any waves. We certainly had some, but there, there's a really interesting contrast that I was considering putting into the um, into the talk that I gave, but opted not to because of time. Um, but there's another data set from uh, Wax Lake Delta that, um, that um, I don't know if they're here, but Greg Snedden and Jarrell Smith were both involved co collecting. Um, and I can send you the report, the lead author is Styles, And they found a situation where um, the, on the mudflats in, in Wax Lake Delta, they're fairly exposed. So you get a lot of wave energy. And what that wave energy does is early in the season when the mudflats are not vegetated, the wave energy actually present, prevents deposition. So it, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the waves coming in, stirring up the sediment, really makes it so that very little can deposit there um, at all. The vegetation has the effect in that system of damping flow, I'm sorry, damping wave energy, but still allowing flow. And I think that has something to do with the way that it's a it's in the Lumbo Marsh, so it's Lotus. So I think that just the fact that the stems are spaced um, differently allows more flow to go through. So there, the vegetation grows in, you get wave energy reduced, but you get the flow, um, and it seems to have the effect of actually increasing the amount of sedimentation you get. Whereas in our case, the primary result of the vegetation was to divert flow to different places. So it's a really interesting contrast and I think really a good way to think about sort of experimenting with vegetation types um, because you had different vegetation in different situations gave you a completely different sedimentary response in the bed. That's a long answer to a simple question, but we didn't have very much waves in our uh, in our no, that makes perfect sense. I guess in terms of uh, when we have waves, we usually look for more fines deposition uh, within the vegetated zone. But while the fines are, I mean, there's very little retention in the bay itself. Uh, but in this case, you're seeing uh, retention more or less uh, evenly across. I guess. I think that's. I think that's about right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That yeah. Thank all. you. Um, we are a little bit over time, so I, I you know, I, I think people are going to start dropping off. Uh, I'm happy to stay on and chat with anybody who uh, wants to remain, um, but there's no obligation to do so. But if anyone else has other questions, uh, please feel, feel free to free to ask them, ask them now. And, and again, you know, don't don't feel any obligation to to remain. Uh, I appreciate everyone who is here. Unfortunately, some people left before I could say thank you, but thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Chris, I, I have a more of a comment. Um, Richie Blink did try to introduce uh, Lotus into Bay Denise and the the Clipper project to the south of it, um, but it did not take. Oh, why do you think? Uh, <laughs> I don't really know. I tried to introduce it behind Shell Matt and it didn't take. Uh -huh. um, it, it's it's really interesting that. Uh, West Bay has such a high wind environment because I thought that was the you know the reason it didn't take because both um, well behind Chalmette is a lot of a lot of wind there but both have the the right um, salinities for it 
uh-huh. it just didn't happen. I, I, the ones I put out, I even grew them out for a couple of weeks to try to get them larger and then planted them and it just didn't happen. Huh. Interesting. But, but we usually see them kind of in more slack water environments in, in mm-hmm. Venice and then in the ninth ward. Mm-hmm. Huh. Uh, another yep. ki- kind of th- you know, Emily was talking about biodiversity um, and I was talking about constraints of LA 39 and even uh, the, the Ag and Forestry Coastal Reveg program. Um, a spec has to be written on any plant that is purchased by those programs and specifications were the kind of big hurdle uh, that had to be overcome to add biodiversity into different planting. So I did a, a beach planting at one point and I think I had six species and I had to write two of the specs for them before I could even do that. So I had to wait a year for the specs to be approved. So that, um, you know, if we're talking about putting in bull tongue, I, I wrote a spec for it and then I uh, called um, RES, uh, Aaron Pierce, who is probably the, the better of the, vegetation um contractors and he he told me like no i can't i can't deliver that uh you know he's like how would i stack them how do i he's like you would have almost no plant left after i went and moved them once and so he's he's like they're too fragile to go put out there so wait so please i wasn't quite sure i understood is is that an argument against being able to do plantings of multiple types in one place or just the particular plant that uh, we're talking about? That, that one's, a, I mean, bull tongue would probably, when Emily was talking, my first thought is like, oh, bull tongue. Uh, you know, like, I, I want to go see the, what the feedbacks are if you plant that with cut grass and, and maybe even lotus or something. But you, you probably would have to do it via tubers for them because the, the leaves are so fragile. Um, yeah that would be interesting i was thinking bultong was one of the species on my mind too so cool yeah, and so can you just clarify, want... what is a spec like is, is it sounds like a very arduous oh thing. i'm sorry specifications and so that that says like uh the plant is from the the root collar to the end of the stem it's one foot or half a foot or um the the root system will be x amount long or you'll you grew it in a four inch pod it must be in the four inch pod it talks about the planting medium um it's just to keep the the growers um bringing a quality product gotcha. huh. okay. but but when they when they don't exist on a plant you're like well what is the ideal like right. does my bull tongue need to be two feet long does it need to be one foot long how long do the roots need to be like i i really don't know yeah you know so i i was left looking at other plants that were had similar types and I drew up some of my specs basically cutting and pasting other specs to it and hoping that that was correct and they got approved so I guess it was (laughs) but um I I think I wrote I wrote two specs while I was there and then we had a, a lady in Lake Charles she wrote four and I think Jeremy Rodriguez who should be in these groups um he wrote I think six so far. So we're getting more plants approved. Yeah. It just takes time and it's, you know, it's, it's a hard, hard deal when you're in like a bureaucracy of like a state or a federal agency. Cool. Yeah, when we plant, when we plant, we, we're just trying to get a rapid colonizer. And yeah. uh, often what we see is that things start to fall in somewhere in, in, inside the plant, you know, inside that colonization. It kind of changes the environment to some extent and it, it opens up little niches for different things to pop up. So, you know, what we're hoping to do is just sort of kind of like, the, you know, introduce the, the vegetation initially and then let the system kind of self-design through, through succession over time. And that's hope, hopefully what we would get is, is biodiversity. Mm-hmm. Wait, but how would you, uh, you, you're saying initiate the design and not, not, do, not do a planting with those plants, but design the environment so that 
the conditions are right for a wider variety of plants. Did I understand that? Yeah, basically, I mean, you would have a rapid colonizer, something that gets in and just takes over. And a lot of times you'll see in these areas, something that just takes off and, and grows. Mm -hmm. and, and as that thing grows, it, it, it kind of does some, some changes in the environment. It, it you know, might lay down more organic material and eventually you'll start to see other things taking advantage of that, um, of that area and start to pop up inside of it. So it's just as doing as from a practical point of view, when you're doing restoration, you really just want to try to put as much, get as much on the ground as you can. And, mm. and so we look for what we, what we used to call, I guess, in, in some of the, some term was the, uh, super plants you know you would just go mm -hmm. in with something and you you would it, it's basically um i guess if you could look in terms in biogeochemistry you would say okay we want to get the or organic matter going mm -hmm. so you you uh put something out there that's going to start to develop you know some kind of layering of organics and then things kind of work from there but it would be the initial step in succession gotcha to, to give a good example, Ron's talking about, if you look at uh, Joe Madeira Marsh or Bay Gentilly, uh -huh. um, those were plantings that were put out uh, about 40 feet from the edge of the marsh. Um, there were bull, mainly bulrush in there. And you can see the marsh come out and meet it. And, you know, it's like Peyton's or Typha coming in behind it and, and expanding what it was doing in that area. And, and, and other other plants as well that that you know would in in that situation there was a whole lot of fetch going on and it was constantly eroding the the edge of it okay. and once you stop that fetch from hitting that shoreline you saw these kind of smaller um wetland plants fill in the gap behind it uh-huh okay gotcha what what uh emily was uh showing though was definitely very interesting and sometimes we don't have the luxury to just sort of put different things in but what she as possibly what she could do is is look at it as this if we get this you know la39 planted and and you guys are are watching it pretty closely what you could do is look at uh you know that succession process the diversity track the diversity change and then also at the same time look at the physical aspects of of how it's trapping uh, and improving the trapping process. I would mm -hmm. think like if you had, like just looking uh, at the, uh, the presentation you had earlier, Chris, um, you know, you, you saw that uh, with submerged aquatic vegetation and there, there's just mm -hmm. an infinite di uh, diversity in, in the type of physical aspects of that, how it, how it traps, how it uh, maybe even pre prevents current in some way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all those different species have different characteristics and they will have impact on how things move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was amazed at how I, 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 controlling the SAV is probably, not controlling like eliminating, but controlling like deciding which type goes where is probably even a bigger challenge. I guess I don't know. I was just really surprised by how dynamic it was in that area and how much it was actually controlling the flow patterns. Uh, I mean, it, it exerted almost complete control of the flow patterns, very little else mattered. Um, and then it just disappeared. I, and I don't know what happened to it. Well, it is sort of ephemeral and you'll see, you know, it has uh, generally, most of the SAV will die off a lot of times in the winter time. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the, the variation in the flows in that. So you would have almost from no flow Mm -hmm. to, to uh, you know, an optimal flow through the system. So there might be, a, a, if you look at, the, say, taking a soil core, you might see variations in the layers. So you mm -hmm. see a, a, a mineral layer mm -hmm. and an organic layer, then mm -hmm. a mineral layer. And, and that's, you know, a diversity of soil development too mm -hmm. in, in the natural sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think when you, when you consider the delta formations, and you look at things over over uh, many many years, and you pour mm -hmm. through it, 
you can you can actually see almost like trick tree, tree rings when the the big depositional event occurred mm-hmm. and, you know stuff like that and and that diversity I, I often wonder how much that diversity in that soil uh, profile uh, means as opposed to say going in and you take a dredge and mm-hmm. you pump in three feet of soil over an area and you grow a marsh I mean it, yeah. it's just is it the same thing I don't know uh, is it yeah. the same quality I'm not sure you know so I, actually this is man, I, I have a question for Maddie if you're still on the line I see you're still there but I don't know if you're still listening but I, I, I actually think I it's related to, hey all right so what Ron was just talking about was uh, uh, the, by Alexi, um, uh, the, the, like the soil quality, I guess, and, and the uh, a lot of that is something we think about in terms of organic storage. Um, I've done a lot of work on that in other contexts, and and like beneficial use of dredge material. So I, I when you showed the flux towers, I was like, oh my god! All right, where where would you put a flux tower? So yeah. it. That's that's like the hardest thing to design in there is, is sort of permanent, like really important fixed instrumentation. Yeah. Yeah, no, those, I mean, those, it, those measurements are so difficult to, you know, you mm-hmm. need to like be able to validate them in all sorts of ways. But yeah, you would want, you, ideally we would have uh, a uniform enough area, um, you know, so like, like half a kilometer um that was relatively uniform and then another relatively uniform but different but also like on the scale of half a kilometer area to Uh be taking those measurements from to compare those two because yeah the soil there's so many i mean that's like one of the big things with uh, all these methane studies is that you see these hot spots um where you get a ton of methane production and it's unclear whether or not that is uh, you know, what's, what's driving that hot spot? Is it soil conditions? Um, is it uh, a, a vegetation hydrodynamic thing? Is it, um, you know, just the microbial community that happened to be there? Um, yeah, figuring out the cause of those things is really difficult. So, um, but soil conditions is definitely a big part of it. Gotcha. When you say hotspot, do you mean like a regional hotspot or do you mean like in an environment, if you've got five flux towers out, one of them is really, really hot? And it doesn't seem to be clear why. Uh, both. Um, so that, yeah, that scale also has been shown to, to vary a lot. So we can be talking about like patch scales, like with those floating chambers that are measuring methane. So two meters away, you've got nothing. And over here, you've got like a, a ton of ebullition coming up, the bubbles coming up. Um, uh, but then also at the, at the flux tower scale. And so that's why like having those uniform conditions uh, for the flux towers is really important if what if part of what you're trying to do is understanding what the drivers of that flux is. Yeah. yeah. And it's going to be different next year completely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, having all those other other aspects uh, measured is really important for making sense of any of uh-huh. these uh, measurements. Sorry, Blaze, go ahead. Oh, Chris, I just want to thank you for putting all this together um, over the years. And then also I wanted to shout out Richie Blink for kind of being the impetus to get all this rocking down there, Bandit East. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, thank everyone who's who's here and has been here. It's been a really, it's it's been a fun meeting to do over the last couple of years. And <laughs> I really do hope, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I, you know, it's what I was talking about today. I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to make that into something of a hub. And we're the Water Institute. We're trying to put a little bit of money and a little bit of infrastructure down so that we can get the ball rolling. And I, I, I have pretty high hopes. Um, and I, I guess I should have flagged this even more severely or loudly or more colorfully at the end before everyone dropped off. But I, I think that it would, you know, we would all do well to really think through kind of um you know who's interested in collaborating in this area and how that might look and and just i i feel like a couple of things get funded in one spot and boom that's a critical mass right there and i I think that this is a really ideal place to look at that and has a relevance that's gonna stay for a long time so for real and and 
one thing to say to like anybody that wants to study biodiversity or plants that we don't normally use in restoration, um, if you need somebody to grow them out, I'm available. Two out of the four pawpaws are still alive in my backyard. Ooh, <laughs> awesome. That's cool. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna need to leave um, pretty much right now. I think that if I leave, I'm not sure if other people can stay, but if, um, I don't know, we'll see what happens. Anyone's <laughs> welcome to stay. Um, everybody, thank you so much. People who've been here for years and, and new attendees as of today and last week. I, thank you very, very much. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Chris. All right, thanks. All right, bye y'all. Bye-bye.